Hi everybody, um, my name is Nat Sims. I'm a physician at Mass General Hospital and I've been here for 30 years. What we have uh, done today is go up to a small room in Ruth Sleeper Hall on the MGH campus where we have a little museum and storage space for uh, patient safety technologies that we've worked on over the 25 or 30 years that we've been thinking about this topic. When I first came to Mass General, we didn't even have computer chips. We had physiological monitors to monitor an electrocardiogram of a patient with a cathode ray tube two feet long containing vacuum tubes made by GE and RCA and discrete electronic components. The user interface of a vital signs monitor in those days, which could only monitor one lead of ECG had an on and an off button and then a few little knobs to adjust the brightness of the screen. That was it. There were no limits. And monitoring a patient at Mass General meant putting one of these screens in a hallway on a cart with a 30-foot cable going back to the patient. Similarly, we were making little amplifiers to drive pens on strip chart recorders. And it was a huge advance and step forward when by the late 1980s we had microprocessor driven monitors that you could set alerts and alarms on that were, had batteries in them and they were portable and then they could travel with the patient and that you could plug them into a computer network in every patient room and begin to establish a, a concept of patient safety that really uh, referred to every patient wherever they were in the hospital and uh, wherever that they were going. So a huge span of technology change in the course of uh, 10 or 15 years going from an era before computers into an era where computers and networks are part of our uh, everyday life. Another way to get your mind back to what our care system was like in the mid-1980s is to look at this photograph of a critically ill patient from the Jackson 4 Cardiac Surgical Intensive Care Unit, uh, again in about 1985. If you remember, this was the era where Mass General was pioneering the treatment of patients with acute myocardial infarction who were unstable. Uh, they would come to the hospital in the process of having an MI. Uh, we would take them immediately to the cath lab. An intraortic balloon pump would be placed to stabilize the heart uh, while the studies were done. And then uh, within 24 hours or so, the patient would go uh, to the operating room for acute revascularization. This was an e extraordinary uh, technical advance. And yet the tools that were available to affect this care were way behind the brilliance of the new therapies. Cardiac surgeons had to go to research laboratories and get old syringe pumps that were used uh, with probably glass syringes and put them uh, by the bedside. Here's a patient whose head is here, whose feet are down here, who's on approximately 14 different drug infusions all being given out of syringes and with pieces of adhesive tape, xylocaine, dobutamine, dopamine, uh, norepinephrine, and so on. Uh, they're using tools uh, that they took out of the research laboratory to try to do something very exciting physiologically, but for which the technology just wasn't up to date. A particular disadvantage uh, of this kind of a system was that if the patient uh, got more ill, and needed to go back to the operating room, it was literally impossible to extract that patient from the ICU because not only were these pumps uh, enormous, but they didn't have any batteries.
for the anesthesiologist, uh, the sort of phone call you never wanted to receive was about uh, taking a patient uh, back to the operating room in extremis uh, from a setting like this. And eventually, the problem began to bother us enough that we decided to try uh, to do something about it. The sense of obligation to speak up and try to do something about, uh, about this uh, was greatly heightened by visiting uh, other hospitals uh, where uh, some of these problems uh, seemed to be being tackled uh, uh, more effectively. And we tried to take and blend those goals, objectives, and ideas back into the MGH environment, many aspects of which couldn't be changed. And so really within a relatively rapid period of time, just two years after this 1985 picture, we have the chief of cardiac anesthesia and a resident bringing a fresh cardiac surgical patient into the old ICU, but with all the devices, smaller, lightweight, battery powered, uh, and uh, aggregated in, in a, into a system that was actually just as functional or even more functional than what we had observed in our tours uh, around the country. In about that time, 86 or 87, there was a particular incident uh, that occurred in this ICU that I will never forget. A newborn uh, with congenital heart disease needed an infusion of a drug called prostaglandin to keep the so-called ductus arteriosus uh, open and enable the blood to, uh, to, mix, uh, uh, to mix a bit uh, while waiting uh, for urgent surgery. Uh, the typical treatment of that is to give uh, intravenous prostaglandin uh, to the baby in a certain dose and the result of the prostaglandin is that the baby uh, whose color is kind of blue uh, turns uh, a little more pink and the uh, measurements that are taken uh, confirm that the drug is working. In the case of this particular baby, uh, for several hours the apparently right uh, intravenous drug therapy just wasn't having uh, the right effect and there was a lot of head, head scratching uh, that occurred until we sort of found the tattered piece of paper on which the complex calculations had been made. There was a 60-fold uh, error uh, in the calculations so that the, the syringe of drug contained uh, too little of the prostaglandin and the baby wasn't uh, receiving enough. Once the problem was identified uh, and, uh, and corrected, uh, the baby got better and had a uh, satisfactory course. Uh, but the, the sort of uh, sense of responsibility uh, to try to prevent uh, any uh, subsequent baby from uh, uh, having a medication uh, error occur. And so we decided to devote a really significant amount of time to reinventing not only the size and the weight and the battery poweredness, but also the software and the electronics inside a drug infusion pumps to help uh, make it easier for clinicians to uh, make these calculations and even to, to, uh, to give the, the drugs with the appropriate uh, prompts and reminders. So there began, uh, you know, another a big project which uh, we're still working on 20 years later uh, to make drug infusion pumps uh, smarter uh, and safer. Smart infusion pump technology started here. It started with clinicians at the bedside. We just really didn't have that guidance at our bedside, I mean, at our fingertips. The pumps were heavy and they were dumb. Uh, and I know we've made mistakes, I know I made mistakes, and we all really thought there had to be a better way to do this. In 1989, as Nat Sims was talking about really, uh, and he's very mild about what he's, his accomplishments, but this also bothered him as well, as he mentioned. And he actually started to work with Baxter Corporation, which eventually made pumps that were smaller, as you saw, those AS20Gs, and we had eight or 10 or 12 of them hanging like, on like a shower curtain, with, you know, taking the patients back and forth to the ICUs. And these pumps did have calculators, but they still weren't what we really needed. At that same time, Harry DeMonico, who was the director of pharmacy at the time, also agreed to make standardized drug mixes for our adult ICU patients, if we decided what the standards were gonna be. He would only make a certain amount of them for us, which made, you know, and not, you know, millions of cocktails for people, but we still had to remember, even though we had those pre-made syringes, is it mics per cake per minute? Is it milligrams an hour? And as our patients got sicker, we had more medications to remember. I couldn't remember this stuff anymore. In the 1990s, 
Sims then actually thought, this is, this is crazy. Nat Sims working diligently with a bunch of other people and actually developed a patent for a smart infusion pump that could house that MGH IV guidelines cookbook right in the pump at the bedside. So we have that knowledge at the bedside. At the same time, as, as Greg mentioned, I had the opportunity to move from an ICU nurse to go into biomedical engineering as a technology specialist. We kind of created that position. It was a very cool position, though, and it still is, because I get to be the kind of the liaison between nursing and biomedical engineering when it comes to technology, and it's been wonderful. In 1994, we found and partnered a vendor uh, with the vendor, a small company called Harvard Clinical right here in Framingham. And together with clinicians from Ellison 4 and pharmacists and anesthesiologists, we really developed a syringe pump with, with a software application that let us to create an electronic copy of that drug library. And I made up the role of the drug library manager at that time. I said, I'm going I'm to start to do this. In 1995, that's what we had to really work hard. We now had a vendor that had a pump, so we had hardware, we had a software application, but now I needed to get all of my colleagues in a room to decide what the drug library was going to be all about. It took about three months, a lot of pizza, locking doors, a lot of gnashing of teeth, people deciding really, well, what's the, what's the most amount of dopamine you'd ever give? What's the least amount? Medicine was a little on the conservative side. Surgery said, all I care is the blood pressure. I don't care how much dopamine you give. But basically, we all had to come to a consensus of what the dosing guidance would be in these infusion pumps. So we ended up actually creating the first clinician-based drug library that contained most of the high harm medications used in the adult ICUs in the operating rooms. These libraries have the drug names, specific concentrations, dose limits, dose modes, and little pop-up reminders that you would need. I actually then created this library, put it into a software application, and with a cable from my computer, touched a thousand channels of syringe pumps to load the, the, load the drug library in, uh, to the infusion pumps. We actually created the first smart infusion pump in the world, and it was ready for clinical trial. And where did we trial almost everything? Ellison 4. Thanks to Sue Tully and Dick Teplick, we called it the innovation unit. I'd go back to all of my colleagues and say, come on, you guys, trial this. This is going to be the coolest thing in the world. And we always ended up going through lots of iterations, going back to the vendors and saying, it's too big, it's too small, the color's terrible, it's too loud, it's too soft. Vendors listen. And actually, in 1996, the first drug library infusion pumps were introduced to Mass General to provide the clinician with knowledge, technology, and confidence to deliver highly complex therapies safely. We didn't stop there. The Joint Commission was talking about getting rid of the, of getting rid of the rule of sixes for pediatrics. We were the first ones to create a NICU and a PICU drug library. And then again, we didn't stop. We had the general care folks saying, what are we, like chopped liver? Like, how come we don't have this dosing guidance at the bedside for our patients? And we ended up making it a truly robust drug library for the general care population, pain management, to the point that by 2008, every single infusion pump at the bedside for every therapy is a smart infusion pump. It was really pretty cool. So what am I really proud of? Today, I'm really proud of the fact that because I was encouraged by my mentors, uh, Jeff Cooper and Sue Tully and all of friends, they really encouraged me to get involved in something I was passionate about, and that I was really able to, to be a contributor to the, changing the landscape of IV med safety. But even more than that, what I'm really proud of is I think I helped motivate clinicians at Mass General to believe in this technology. Where you have an idea first can make all the difference. That's because I want to emphasize that Mass General is a place that listens really well to clinicians when they want to raise an issue about something that doesn't feel right or could be uh, done better. And it's that whole culture of support, receptiveness to challenging questions, receptiveness to the energy of folks who want to try to make something better, a receptiveness for folks who have an idea for a device or a tool or a piece of software that they think is worth making and prototyping and testing and proving out and improving. That's the spirit of MGH that is uh, perhaps best illustrated by the devices and the stories that we've talked about in this, uh, in this brief video.